As we have said, we are giving continuation to this trimester of charity. Um, and it's never enough for us to approach this topic in different, from different ways, um, with different ideals as well. And tonight, Kirsten will be talking about the spirit view of Valentine's Day. Who doesn't hear, uh, remember the hit, 1978 hit from John Young, Love's in the Air? Can anybody sing that? They asked me to sing, but unfortunately, no, we're not going to do that, okay? We're not going to do it, no. And we're not here to talk about music anyways, even though the song is pretty, pretty nice um, and really touches our heart, but I'm pretty sure Kirsten tonight will touch our heart in a different way, different way uh, talking about Valentine's Day, because there is also a spirit spiritualist and a spiritist side of it as well that we can discuss and learn from her. So, Kirsten, please. Thank you, Leo. Would anyone else like to sing that song? No, okay, just checking. We did try to bribe Leo to sing that. It didn't work. Good evening, everyone. It's a nice, cold, wintry day. <coughs> Yet you all made it out to come and hear us speak. So God bless you. You'll be warm. Our heater is up and running. No worries. And we're packed full of chocolate because today, well, it's not Valentine's Day, right? It's not a religious holiday. Well, maybe it is if you're celebrating. Love. Yeah, Love yeah, or if you're celebrating St. Valentine, even though, and I'll talk about that in a second, there, there were a couple of St. Valentines. It wasn't just one. Did you guys know that? It wasn't just one guy named St. Valentine. Actually, it's a couple, and history is kind of sketchy, as it always is, because, you know, way back in the time of the Romans, not everybody just, you know, jotted things down. There weren't historians as we have today. There wasn't internet. But there were like random, you know, people who were specialized, scribes, to take note of history. So thankfully for them, we have some, um, some things that are kept in history for us to reflect on. So not that this is a real formal class, but who doesn't like handouts? Who doesn't love them? To take them home and just to throw them away. No, kidding. <laughs> so hopefully you actually do read them. Um, some people just like to put them on their refrigerator. I wanted to read this, just the first one. It's a very small message. Thank you, Leo. Yes. I guess I need one, too, in order to read it, right? <laughs> I'm not that evolved yet where I can just spit it off the top of my head like that. This message probably touched us a very long time ago. Um, it's located, forgive me, I didn't put the actual page, <coughs> but it is located in the Gospel according to Spiritism. And it was a larger message, but this is the particular paragraph that I actually have kept with me for years. I don't know how many years it's been, but I've kept it in a binder and have referred back to it because I found it to be so poetic. Now the spirit who psychographed this message through the medium, just named himself a protector spirit, but I felt it relevant for today's talk. So bear with me, I'll read it and we can just absorb it. If you have love, you have everything there is to be desired on the earth. You possess the most excellent pearl that neither circumstances nor the evils of those who hate and persecute you will be able to take away. If you have love, you will have put your treasure where worms and rust cannot reach, reach it. And you will see everything that might stain its purity erased from your soul. You will feel the weight of matter grow lighter day by day and like a bird soaring in the sky with no memory of earth, you will ascend without ceasing. You will ascend forever until your exhilarated soul satiates itself with life in the bosom of the Lord. And this message was, re was received in Bordeaux in 1861. It's a beautiful message. It's a message of hope. It's a message of renewal of the idea that there is something so much greater out there than us that is so fulfilling that literally you'd be flying on cloud nine. That's that sensation, that exhilaration when we truly have love in our heart. And that's why 
there's you know so, so much research that's already been published I'd say in the last decade in regards to people who volunteer most notably we've talked so much about Dr. Stephen Post there's been interviews with him um, we've met him and his research is it's, it's just right there for you to review it to look at it he actually published a book um, I believe it's called it's good to be good I believe more or less but you can google him and basically he just says he has shown in his research that when people do acts of goodness in whatever arena physiologically it reverberates back to us and it's good for us so it makes sense that when we practice acts of love that we have a sensation of floating the sensation of being lighter and lighter and just a sense of peace to be over you if you've ever done something good for someone else, you've had a little bit of a glimpse into that. And if you're a kind person daily and you do nice things, you probably have this lightness, this softness about you that maybe you don't even realize. But if you go and do something that's out of your norm, but it's a kindness, act of love towards someone else, you will see that this little passage is as true as it was in 1861 as it will be in the centuries to come. But you know, one of the things when today we were, um, I saw a good friend of mine this morning and uh, him and I were talking and uh, we were discussing this idea of Valentine's Day. And it's quite funny because we were saying to him, you know, why do we have to celebrate it? You know, you, we grow up in this culture, and at least in the U.S. because that's where I grew up, and people just celebrate holidays. Just, you know, it's just what you do when you're a child. You don't really think about it. And when, when we were children and as my own daughter is, you know, growing up and, it's just commonplace, you go and buy cards, but why do we do that? What's the real purpose? You know, we never stop to think why we do certain things in our culture because it's just culturally accepted, it's just the cultural norm, social norm, so we do it. But how about we take a little trip down history lane and see, not necessarily why we do it, but at least where some of the ideas are derived from. So did you know that many, many, many centuries ago in Rome, they actually had this pretty, respectfully I'm going to say weird festival. It was called the Lupercalia Festival and there's some question over whether this festival necessarily was in honor of Lupercus who was a god of fertility or a god I believe whose name is Panis or something to that effect. Um, but there was this festival that used to go on called the Lupercalia Festival to make a long story short, basically as it's sort of depicted in this little image here, it was a more uh, G, PG rated photo I could find on the web. Basically, men would go into a cave and they would kill goats and dogs, young dogs, because they were seen as very fertile, um, I guess, animals. So they would kill them and they would skin their, their hide, I guess, take their skin, wrap some of it around as like a, like a loincloth and they would take other pieces of their skin and they'd rub their blood on them and they'd run throughout the city hitting people with the, the skin of the dead animals and people believed that if you got hit you became more fertile. So of course many women were lining up outside to be smacked with these dead things and it was totally normal. Nobody thought, you know, why are we doing this? Maybe some did, but people did this. So of course at some point, probably around maybe 400, 500 AD, more somewhere in that time period, when Christianity was sort of swept over Rome, the church kind of had a problem with this. They, they didn't like the pagan rituals. So this is another gray area where in some literature you read they say that the church replaced this festival of Lupercalia and they created St. Valentine's Day. Well, there was a, there was, um, a priest who was made a saint. I, think, I believe it's called canonizing. And he actually did die, supposedly, on February 14th. So at that time, they, the church decided, the Catholic Church, you know what? We're going to celebrate his death on February the 14th, which is the day right before the Lupercalia Festival. So there's some iffiness to it, because even when you look at Christmas and other holidays, we see it's sort of wrapped around a lot of the pagan holidays. So we're not saying that that's what it was, but it's just quite interesting that there's a lot of holidays that have evolved surrounding pagan holidays. But we're not here to judge. Spirit has been here to judge. We know 
the law of progress is always in effect. We're always moving ahead, trying to think of better ways to express ourselves. And also, as I put here, um, in the month of February, there was a Feast of the Purification of the Virgin, which is celebrated on February the 2nd. And there also is this, depending upon, again, what you read, there was this Pope in 5C, Pope Gelasius. It was said that he was the one who created, who put together this February 14th to celebrate St. Valentine's Day, but there actually is this old Greek text that you actually can find online. No, I don't read Greek, but somebody else did. And um, you can go and look it up. It's letter 100 to Andromachus. It basically states that this pope, he writes a letter against and forbidding the celebration of the Lupercalia because he believes it's against God, it's against their religious beliefs. So now that we know that, who wants to celebrate St. Valentine's Day? No, just kidding. No, but it's interesting to know where all these things have derived from. So now we come upon where we, actually we don't really celebrate St. Valentine. I don't know anyone who actually celebrates this particular saint. The particular saint who supposedly we're supposed to be honoring, he actually was martyred. Um, at the time in Rome, when there's a lot of wars going on, the emperor had noticed that a lot of his soldiers were very homesick. So they performed very badly on the battlefield. So he made a decision that young men were forbidden to get married. But this particular priest said, well, I'm not going to stop marrying people. So in secret, he would marry young men and women. When the emperor found out about it, he approached him. He asked him to denounce his faith. He said no, obviously. And they wound up, there's different stories. Some say that he was beheaded, just killed. And there's this story, again, depending on what text you read, that he, when he was jailed prior to being um, killed, he fell in love with one of, the sold, one of the guard's daughters, and other accounts say that he had prayed for her and healed her, and so, and they also, there also are accounts uh, in history that people whom he had married would come to the jail and bring him flowers, um, little things of food for him so that people say that's kind of how this idea of flowers came around as well, why we exchange. There are a lot of little tidbits throughout history we can see why things are celebrated. And it's interesting because when we say that St. Valentine there wasn't just one, this name Valentine seemed to have been given to certain people because of its meaning as well. I don't know if all of you in the back can see that it's kind of low, I apologize for that. But the word Valentine itself, and the Latin word, actually the root valens, means strong, vigorous, and healthy. It's just something interesting for us to think about when we're given names and names and their origin. But what about those cute little cherubs we always see? These little angels flying. Those also are derivative of Roman times. There was a Roman uh, god named Cupid, and he was very mischievous. He liked to pair people together who would, who would never otherwise fall in love. He would shoot an arrow, and he would think, of, and this is the Greek mythology, he thought it was very funny to put together the most odd, oddest couples and watch them suffer, and he would laugh. That's the Greek mythology, but nowadays we have these cute, adorable little angel-like people who look so sweet who shoot arrows and make people fall in love. So this is kind of a little bit about the history. There's much more about it, of course. It's not the whole purpose of our meeting tonight. But believe it or not, other people in the world celebrate Valentine's Day. It is not, well, I suppose it is celebrated widespread throughout the U.S., but it, it wasn't really a U.S. holiday, as we have just seen. It started in Rome somehow. And Brazil celebrates something similar to Valentine's Day. It's called, if there's a Brazilian in the audience, you can say, pronounce that. Thank you. <laughs> Here we go. Let's ask the Brazilian to pronounce that. Dia dos Namorados. Thank you very much. We always like to keep a Brazilian on hand just in case. Um, on this particular holiday, and you guys can, some of you who are Brazilian or who are not, you can see that basically it's a holiday where they exchange gifts. It's usually for those who are dating, not married. At least it's what my husband tells me. Maybe that's why I don't get gifts. <laughs> but <laughs> oh, we're married. We don't have to get it. <laughs> no, no. All jokes aside. So, but they actually celebrated in June. 
June 12th to be exact. So they also have their own little um, happy holidays there, although we don't know the origins of that from Brazil, but it seems like it's similar to the ones here in the US. In Spain and actually all over Europe, they do celebrate some um, on and off, depending upon what regions you live in. But as we were researching this, we found that uh, Valentine's Day isn't so prevalent as much as St. George's Day. It's just another saint, and they give roses, and actually books are exchanged with loved ones. So not necessarily chocolate. So it's interesting, and they celebrate that on April 23rd. Russia, same thing. Actually, in certain cities, um, depending upon, again, where you find yourself, uh, there are certain archbishops who have banned it. So it's just interesting. Some of this is widespread. Some of it's not. But of course, we have to always come back from, to our root purpose of this discussion tonight, which is the spiritist perspective of Valentine's Day. So we see that there is a um, historical aspect of it, um, where it comes from, how it started, how it has evolved, how as a society we have accepted it and sort of made it our own and every culture and every country and city has adapted it to m basically meet its needs. So as spiritual people or as a religion, philosophy slash science, we have our own take on, our own perspective. And we don't look at we don't look at it from a, I would say, closed perspective. We look at it from a much more broader perspective. So there's nothing wrong, I have to say right off the bat, there's nothing we don't believe that there's anything wrong with celebrating the holiday at all. To each his own. If it's something good, if you're expressing love, ex Expressing positive emotions is always a positive, it's always a healthy thing for anyone to do. But of course we always go back to our beloved Joanna De Angelis because she is, we have lovingly deemed, I'm just looking for one of her books, um, Spiritist Psychologist because she always touches on this more profound psychological perspective of things. So we wanted to bring something she said to start us off. In the book, Open Your Heart and Find Happiness in Chapter 18, small message, she says some, the following, and this is just a little snippet of it. She says, at no time can you find the instruction, be loved. On the contrary, in all the teachings, the rule is always to love. So that's kind of like the backbone of how we want to start off this conversation, that we believe that it is we should utilize these holidays as an opportunity to practice love, loving others, giving kindness. You don't have to give out chocolates. None of you want that. But there's nothing wrong with it in the same way. And she mentions that, and I'll bring up the quote, but one of the things she says is that we have to go through these steps. It's like before you get to graduate school, you got to do undergrad. You got to do all the fulfillments, all the course requirements, everything. Otherwise, graduate school is never going to accept you. It's just the way that it is. It's so naturally, we cannot progress forward without first understanding how to love and have relationships and deal with those sort of things. So we wanted to mention a couple things, one of which is the, love of law, the law of love and charity, and also the law of attraction and antipathy and sympathy, how that also plays into this holiday. Because of course, and you can read more about the law of love charity in the Spirits book, part three. We're just gonna do a very quick and brief little snippet of it. We, we encourage you to read it. It's very beautiful and enlightening. But basically, in essence, it teaches us how to be good to others, returning good for evil, even to our enemies. True comprehension of charity is helping before being asked we really felt that this was pretty moving, and you can read about this in the questions 887 through 889. But the spirits actually tell us, and we paraphrased here, about our personal responsibility to seek out those truly in need. They say something like, look for those who look or appear as if they need help. Don't wait for people to come to you and have to lower themselves and their self-esteem, or see if they appear to need assistance we we'll give you a very basic example. You're driving along a road, someone has a flat tire. You could stop and ask, hey, are you okay? And the guy didn't wave you down, or the woman, whoever. But you never know who it could be. There's that uh, famous story, it's pretty old. Um, I believe it was a, so many cars break down on the highway, right? And it was a very wintry night one day, and there was a woman who got stuck. And the man was driving by, it was kind of late at night. And a lot of people don't like to stop for safety reasons but to each his own again. Um, 
the man stopped. He saw it was a slightly older woman and he was concerned. So he stopped and he helped fix her little car. I don't know what was wrong with it. And, and um, she said, oh, can I, can I at least get your name so I can pay back? He said, no, no, no. And she insisted. So she got his information. And that was that. And he, weeks later, he hadn't heard from her. And he didn't really care. And it was fine. And one day, he gets a letter. And it turns out that that woman was the mother of Bill Cosby. So you never know who you're helping. I'm not saying you should start helping people because maybe you're helping a famous person's mother or sister or brother or uncle. But it's always good to help. We heard a story recently about a volunteer fireman who he had a regular job, but he said he was always so anxious to really, you know, run into a burning building and save somebody so he can come home to his kids and be like a hero. And he said that one day he was going out on a job, they had called him, and a woman just had a her most of her home was caught fire. But the his captain said, you know, the other guys are taking care of it. Just hang out right here. And this captain at one point said, you know what? Just that corner of the house is not yet caught fire. Can you grab her shoes? Because she has no shoes on. So he's like, oh, I'm going to get shoes. So he goes and gets the shoes and thinks like, oh, this is so pathetic. Later, weeks later, the woman wrote a very long letter to the fire department thanking them and, and actually mentioning how kind and thoughtful those firefighters were to even bring her shoes because she was so out of her mind that her whole house was being burned before her. So it's just interesting. Going off on a tangent there, but it's always good to do good for goodness sake. But this is something else we don't tend to think of when we think about celebrating St. Valentine's Day or a day of love. So we talked about the historical aspect of it, how it came about more or less. We talked about the law of charity and love very briefly, brief overview of that. But what about love in and of itself? What about its psychogenesis, its development, and the sublimation of the emotion love? So how is that? If we look at humanity in general, you know, from the time that cavemen were, because as spiritists we believe that we evolve, we believe in evolution, and ironically in creation at, at the same time, and it's because we believe that God has created everything, and yet we also believe that we evolve through successive reincarnations. So at some point, we were at the level of cavemen, and now we find ourselves much more evolved, or a little bit there, <laughs> some of us. Um, but at some point, we have to sublimate that emotion love. So the caveman, he has that rudimentary love. He does. We read about it in the spiritist literature. So Joanna DeAngelis, in a very excellent book that is here, Existential Conflicts, I'm just going to grab it real quick. It is a phenomenal book, which I will quote from. And she talks about a particular chapter that's entitled Love. And it's amazing because she talks about the psychogenesis, the development, the sublimation of love. So the psychogenesis, also a really good book that soon will be in English. Evolução em dois mundos, evolution in two worlds. It also details about the evolution of our species, how we are created as a humanity from the smallest cell to a full functioning organism and how much thought is put into it and how many spirits are involved with working like um, engineers, loving and just it's a beautiful book, and we couldn't even begin to talk about it. But it's very pertinent to our talk today, because in terms of the psychogenesis, and I'm going to quote, It is in that phase that the future constitution of the ego will be shaped, while the intelligent principle, although asleep, begins the elaboration of the individualization of the self. And that's from Joanna DeAndros in this book. But in Evolution of Two Worlds, they talk about that. They talk about the internships we have to go through to, for instance, having an autonomic nervous system. We breathe without even consciously needing to do so. We have a lot of things that happen automatically in our body that we don't need to consciously think of. It just happens. If you are a full functioning, healthy individual. So it's interesting that we do go through these phases. So when Joanna DeAngelis talks about this psychogenesis of love. She talks about it and she says the following. Development happens by the moral contribution of the individual's efforts to acquire independence, to be capable of loving, 
practicing self-love, overcoming insecurity, fear. So it's interesting. So when we talk about development, it's not just something that just happens. We do have to partake in it to some degree or to a large degree. Or rather, I should say, we could expedite our progress by being more active. And as she says here, the moral contribution. So when we think about Valentine's Day and how it relates to this, well, we are intelligent beings. And we can utilize the things that exist within our own society for the betterment of myself and for others. So for instance, are we saying that you should go around giving Valentine's Day cards to everybody? Not necessarily. But if it's an act of goodness, for instance, we were watching a video on YouTube recently that there was a group of people that had put together these little care packages and were handing them out to people who line up outside to go into the homeless shelters. And nobody ever thinks about them on Valentine's Day. Perhaps those people haven't celebrated in a long time and maybe you think, well, it's not really significant. But for them, it's just nice to be thought about, to receive a little piece of candy and a toothbrush and a pair of socks. Perhaps they won't be pink, but you know, maybe they'll just be something loving that they'll greatly appreciate it. So this moral contribution is from our own effort that we need to make. So we can utilize these things, such as Valentine's Day or any other holiday for our own benefit. Because we see throughout the animal kingdom how love is developed, as we see how in Roman times they would worship and have certain festivals, but nowadays we don't feel a necessity to have those types of festivals. So when people say, well, we haven't evolved much, we would say, well, perhaps we need to look more in depth into history and how far we really have come. So from the animal kingdom, when the mother cub licks her little baby cub, that love eventually develops into a mother's love for her child or grandchild. And eventually, the idea is for it to expand, to be like how Mother Teresa would love. That great love, loving without boundaries, without conditions, which is not, a, not easy for us right off the bat. It takes time for us to practice that. But Joanna DeAndre says the following, that love is the essential basis for a happy existence. essential basis for happy existence. So I guess we could ask ourselves, how well do I love others, myself as well? Have we ever asked ourselves that question? How well do I love? Because in this book, she actually poses that question for people. How are you loving other people? Be more concerned what you're doing for others and less, concerns how much, less concerned how much the other person is giving towards you. And of course, she always talks about being more understanding. She equates it with when a, when a person has a dog or a cat, you don't get angry at the cat. The cat doesn't come and give you a hug every time you come home because you understand it's a cat or it's a dog and they don't necessarily always have the conscious of mind to do that. So likewise, she says, well, why would you be angry at somebody another human being who can't rise to your expectations. They have limitations. Although you could say, well, that's, a, that's an animal. This is a human being. Well, we have to learn that we are all at our own level. And that's difficult for some reason to, to grasp that concept, to understand that this person who just cut you off in traffic and you're all just sitting there and he cuts you off and just ran by 30 other cars and you're really mad, like, wanting to call him a few choice words, but instead it takes this moral contribution of ourselves to have a sort of pep talk and say, understand that that's where he is at, if he feels that necessary. It's sort of a funny analogy, but we can use it on a larger scale when people do more horrendous things in life, which are much more difficult to understand. And uh, the friend I was speaking to today is um, going through social work school. And he was sharing with me today that he has this, they have these discussions in his social work class. And the professor had asked, well, when you, because he's also training to be a therapist. And the professor had asked, well, would you prefer to have the file of your client or patient before or after you meet them? And of course, everybody says, oh, no, after, after, because then you're going to have a prejudgment. 
you're not going to see the person the same way. And he said something interesting to me. And he said, Kirsten, if you're the kind of person to judge, it doesn't matter whether you receive it before or you receive it after. So, and that's what I told, and everybody in class disagreed with me, but the idea is that we don't judge, that you understand that people are at different places in their lives, come from different backgrounds, not just different backgrounds, but different lifetimes, different existences that have added on to where they're at. It's so complex that oftentimes one hour, or hopefully we won't go as long as an hour, because I would like your interaction. If you guys have anything to say, forgive me, I hadn't said this in the beginning, but if you have a comment or question, just throw your hands up in the air. I will give you the mic. I will give you the floor. You can speak, because I would like to hear your feedback. But the idea one day is to have that sublimated love where a, someone might come to your office or you might meet someone or you receive a file of someone who committed all these heinous crimes and you meet the person and you're, you have sublimated that emotion of love so much that you're, you understand that that's what that person what is, you know, they're just at a different level. And you're, no, you're not necessarily better than them, but you're at a different place. So we're not here to judge. Because that's exactly, in essence, what Jesus did. So he had people surrounding him, his disciples, who betrayed him, denied him, didn't understand him sometimes. Yet he understood, and he already saw them as being perfect, as being this great individual. The same way a mother looks at her small son and can already see the great man one day he's going to be. Oh, he's going to be wonderful. And then when he becomes a great man, she only sees a little baby that he used to be. Because we just, we take images of people in our minds. Sometimes that could be a good and a bad thing at the same time. But I digress. When we talk about St. Valentine's Day, when we talk about love, we talk about the history, we talk about, about psychogenesis of love, and all those things are sort of playing together as these factors. But also we know, in the Spirit's book, they talk about antipathy and sympathy. Why do I like certain people when I meet them right off the bat? I just, oh, this person is just great. You know, I met this person today, it's, and you just know that this is going to be your best friend, your good friend, or someone new starts at your job, and you just, you just get this feeling about them. You just, it just sends shivers up your spine. What is that? Is that because they are truly evil? And because they're, you know, throwing negative thoughts your way, are they hexing you? What is up with that? So we have those, we have those questions. Of course, Kardec asked those questions of the spirits, not in those exact words, but in so many words. He wanted to understand why there was this idea, there, there exists, existed and exists till today, antipathies and sympathies. A couple of the questions we'll share. One of which Kardec asked the spirits, besides a general sympathy that results from various similarities, are there special affections among spirits? Before we share the answer, there is actually a section in the spirits book where it's antipathies and sympathies among spirits. So it deals mainly, or in part, Kardec wanted to know, well, how is it in the spirit realm when people are, have this sympathy towards one another and vice versa? So the spirits answer, yes, just as among humans. However, the link that unites spirits is stronger in the absence of the body because they are no longer exposed to the vicissitudes of the passions or of passions. So our carnal body at times can be an impediment. We know that on many different levels. The next question, does the affection that two beings had for each other on earth always continue in the spirit world? We will always have this question ingrained in our mind because I remember uh, years ago when there was a gentleman who I met, a friend of mine, who had been married three times. He's, old, he's older, gentleman. And one of the questions we were discussing, as I don't remember how we got into the conversation about religion and spirituality and life after death, as sometimes we do. He said, well, what's going to happen because I had two prior wives who died? And I have a third wife who's still alive. He said, so when I die, who will I be with? <laughs> he, he was extremely concerned about this. He, he, he generally, he was like, you know, I know my first wife is going to be so pissed. 
but my second wife, you know, I think she's going to be okay because she, you know, she's pretty cool. And you know, if my third wife dies, oh, I'm, I'm going to be in hell. That's going to be it. So we remember distinctly finding this question and discussing it with him. And let's answer it because this is verbatim what we shared with him. Let's repeat the question again. Does the affection that two beings had for each other on earth always continue in the spirit world? The spirits answer, yes, undoubtedly. If it is based on true sympathy, but if physical attraction has had more influence than sympathy, it will cease with the cause. Affection among spirits are more solid and lasting than on earth because they are not subject to the whims of material interest and self-love. It comes to mind the book Nosolar, which we are sold out of. Okay. In the book Nosolar, there's a, a little story in it where they're in the, they're in Nosolar. And I was, trying, I was like, what's the colony's name? They're in Nosolar, the colony, the spirit colony. And Andrea Louise, who is the spirit doctor who's narrating this story through the medium Chico Xavier, he basically, uh, Andrea Louise, gives us an account of when he was in the spirit world. He goes to this particular house to meet new friends. And he notices that in the house, there lives three people, two women, one guy. So as he befriends them, he learns of their story, that the gentleman was married to both women while in the physical realm. The first wife, whom he had a great affinity with, di died in childbirth at a very young age. So because he had, I believe he had a few children, I think he remarried, something to that effect. But the moral of the story, the point of the story is that when the second wife died and she came to the spirit realm, she was kind of like shocked because her husband had died before her. And here he was living with his first wife. Is, and she kind of, and you can read about it in the book Nos Solar, it's very interesting because Andrea Louise was so taken aback by it, like, whoa, like this is a soap opera. But it's interesting because the second wife gave an account that, look, I, I understand the love that we have is much more fraternal. So it's very interesting because probably in the future, maybe in a couple of centuries, probably it'll take for me, but maybe for you, for you guys, it'll just be one more lifetime, or maybe it's in this lifetime already, you have the ability to really understand to have this to have that emotion of love truly sublimating at a more higher level yes can it be the opposite can what be the opposite <laughs> we're going to I, I believe we're going to cover a, a question sort of like that but it, everything has to do with affinities Oh, I'm sorry. So, uh, you want to just re re repeat the question? Mm -hmm. So she's asking uh, Anita. Or Anita was asking, "Well, what if the the story is the opposite? What if you really don't want anything to do with them?" And we were saying to Anita that what well, all has to do with sympathy. So, in the spirit realm, un unlike kind of here in Earth, um, things work with energy. So, the story I told you, they all were in sync, more or less, with one another. They understood each other. Now. There wouldn't come someone who was opposite to that. It just wouldn't, it wouldn't gel, basically. It wouldn't work out. That particular person would find himself in a different location in a vibration that was most appropriate to his level. Yes, it's, you're, many people have that thought, as this gentleman did. Yes, many people do, yes. You know, there's a really funny story I'm going to share with you very briefly. Um, but actually, Givaldo tells this story. And please, if anyone knows this story and I mess it up, please correct me. But there was a, um, a gentleman who approached Givaldo. And he said, Givaldo, um, I think it was his wife had died. He wanted to remarry, or he did remarry. And he was so worried that his wife in the spirit world was being very jealous and envious. And he was so worried. And he was telling Givaldo this. And then the spirit of his deceased wife appeared to Givaldo and said, Givaldo, you tell him that he was the one who was extremely jealous. It wasn't me. So Givaldo is disclosing this story. So it's very funny because sometimes we think that our spouse is the one with the problem. And it's also just very funny. When he tells the story, it wasn't um, something negative. It all was taken as something light and funny. 
So we move on to other questions because we know that there are other topics uh, or other questions as Arnita was asking, um, other perspectives on this topic we wanted to share. So Kardec also asked, and we wanted to include this question because there's a lot of ideas that exist about soulmates, my better half, or so we wanted to sort of dispel that, at least from a spiritist perspective, that understanding of soulmates or your better half. So Kardec asked the question, are souls who must get together predestined for such a union from their origin? And does each one of us have in some part of the universe our, quote, other half, whom we will someday inevitably join? What do you guys think? Maybe? Yes? Hmm? Who knows? Let's see, what, let's see what the spirits say. Dun, dun, dun. They say no. There is no particular and predestined union between two souls. Unions exist among all spirits, but in different degrees, according to the order they occupy. That is, according to their degree of purification. The greater their purification, the more united they are. All the ills of humankind are born from discord. Concord gives rise to complete happiness. So in essence, I don't have some person that exists who is, completes me, who is my better half. You know, there are people who we feel complement us, which I think is probably the better terminology to use, that there are people who we mesh well with, gel well with, who we have things in common, we're at the same level, we get each other, and that's great. Because in this incarnation, in this process of evolution, we want someone that's going to help us. It's going to be our support system when we need them and vice versa. So they kind of dispel that idea because some people believe. And we're not knocking that. If you do believe it, that's fine. We're just coming because since we are a spiritist center, we, we bring spiritist ideas. And we just so happen, obviously, to agree with them. And that's in question, <gasps> giving myself away, no, number 298. But we love this because... <laughs> I'm just bad segue, but we, there was such a funny movie, a little X-rated, Jerry Maguire that came out 1990s, I think, something like that. And it was so famous because it had a couple of really big catchphrases like show me the money and other things. But there is this very moving scene that many women wept at in the movie theater. It's when, I forget her, Renee Zellweger and Tom Cruise, <laughs> they were looking at each other from across the room and he begins to blurt out things to her and she says something around like, you had me at hello and it's so moving and they embrace and they kiss. And the, the famous phrase is, you complete me. And it's like, oh my gosh, <laughs> yes, you complete me. But oh. do people complete us? Do you, did, did this character really complete Renee Zellweger? Well, let's see what Spiritism says. In question 301 of the Spirits book, are two sympathetic spirits each other's complement, or is such sympathy the result of perfect affinity? The spirits answer, the sympathy, the sympathy that attracts one spirit to another is the result of the perfect harmony of their tendencies and instincts. If one of them were necessary, were necessary to complete the other, it would lose its individuality. So we are individual beings. So we could say that if you are with someone who you're losing your individuality with or trying to take that away, it's probably not a healthy situation, but that's a topic of discussion for another day. But the spirits are clear here. So we can complement each other in the sense that, as we discussed earlier, but we do not complete one another. And perhaps it's something we should think about if we feel as though that there are certain people in our lives that without them, you would die probably would warrant us doing a self-evaluation about what's going on in our, in our inner world. Because according to the spirits, that shouldn't, that shouldn't really occur because we are individuals. Even when we die, we lose our physical body, we go back to the spirit realm, we still retain our individuality. We never lose that. Thank goodness. Yes, you may ask another question. No, no mic. Okay, go ahead. You wait. Okay, that's okay too. So is that clear? We thought that we, were, we just grabbed a bunch of questions that seem pertinent to these particular topics that usually people have these conversations around the water cooler about, you know, people completing people. 
and this wholeness you feel with others and relationships. Because when it gets down to the nitty gritty, we live in a world of relationships. We're constantly having relationships with ourselves, with our spouse, with our professors, whomever. We have to learn how to deal with people. And that's not always easy. That's why we have wonderful books to enlighten us. I'm actually going to do one or two more slides and then I'm going to open up for questions. So that's kind of why we're created, actually. Not why, but we were created to be social beings so we could help one another to progress because I learn more when I'm around others. And that's not my own statement. That's a, what we believe in these spiritist ideas. Actually, a lot of people believe it even outside of spiritism. They believe that we are social beings. But of course, in the Spirit's book, in the Law of Progress, the Law of Society, I believe it is as well. They talk about that we are social beings. It makes sense, right? Jefferson was immersed in his, in his society at that time, and he realized that people needed things to be more advanced. If you learn about Thomas Jefferson and all the little knickknacks that he created to make our lives easier, you know, if he had lived isolated by himself, maybe he would have created a bunch of those things. And what about Edison? Maybe he would have created those things, but probably not. People see a society, they see a need. So it makes sense. This is how God has created us to be as such. So the following question Karlick also asked, in what sense should we understand the term other half, which certain spirits use to designate sympathetic spirits? The expression is not correct. If one spirit were another's other half, it would be incomplete when separate from the other. And again, we are individuals. So we wanted to briefly touch on this idea of antipathy as well. And this kind of perhaps Ernita might answer a little bit of your question as well, that two spirits are not necessarily evil just because they are not sympathetic. Antipathy may originate from a dissimilarity in their way of thinking, but as they evolve, these shades of dissimilarity are erased and the antip antipathy disappears. Let, me, let us explain what that means. So, for instance, when you meet someone and you have that feeling of, oh, I don't like them very much, or maybe you know someone ongoing and you just you don't care for them too much. It may mean that you have some past life with them that might be bad. But what the spirits are also saying here is that it might just be that you think differently. And so the energy just doesn't flow because that person thinks differently. They do things their own way and it just doesn't gel well with you. So it's not necessarily that they're evil or that you're evil. It just means that you are different people. So that means that we need to work on dealing with that, dealing with people who are different from us and learning to respect that they too have something beneficial to bring to the table. And sometimes with our pride, we think, well, no, this is the way, this is the way that I should do it. But if we step back and realize that everybody has something good to bring to the table in their own unique way, then we'd be a lot more harmonious with ourselves and with other people. And of course, I, uh, I have to say it again, I encourage you guys to read these questions in the Spirits book because there's a lot more, and I didn't have the time to bring all of them, but they are all, all very enlightening. Well, we wanted to end with, with Joanna DeAngelis. She is one of our personal favorites. Really, I shouldn't say that. She's not our personal favorite. She's just one of many who have many enlightening ideas that are so profound that you take a little teaspoon of her and yet you feel so fulfilled and it makes you reflect about life and there in this particular book that we're also sold out of open your heart i believe it's open your heart and five find happiness where she says the following it is something i would like for all of us to think about to just take into your being and it reminds us when we read this the first time a couple years ago uh, Paul's letter to the church of Corinth about love, love is patient, love is kind, although she's not trying to replace that, but in her own poetic way, she sort of adds to it in our mind when she says that love does not accuse but corrects. It does not frighten but helps. It does not punish but educates. It does not expel but builds up. It does not destroy but saves. When love inhabits people's hearts, goodness will illuminate evil, and harmony will fill every soul. Even those who follow at lower levels will feel stimulated to reach 
for higher levels of liberation. So no matter where we are in this path of evolution, no matter how lowest of lowest we are in the scale, everyone has that ability and that spark within them to move forward, to be stimulated. Nobody's ever forgotten about. But if we have this love, if we are able to work on it through holidays, utilizing the things that exist already in, in our society, taking advantage of it in a positive sense to make a difference. And just like the firefighter, one of the things that the firefighter stated at the end of his story, he said, and I will share with you all, that never think that something is too small an act or too insignificant to do. Well, I'm just going to be opening a door. That's not significant. It is significant to that person who might have needed that at that time, who might be down or low, because we never truly know what someone is going through. And to love is always good for us and for others. I thank you. And I will open up for questions. Abby, if you still had your question. OK. I think I'm OK with that. Though. OK, you're OK with that, Mike. OK. While I was sitting here, it's not a question. It just what came up for me was the saying, and I don't know where I heard it, but just loving what is. Mm -hmm. That just whatever is going on, or whoever that person is, just to try not to judge them, because like you said, you don't know what is happening with them. I just think it's so simple, just loving what is. That's yeah. that. I love that. That's wonderful, Abby. That's so true. Just love what is. You know, that gives other people such a good feeling, especially when there are people who are really hard on themselves or don't know what to do with themselves. So as a side note, to, to add to what you said, that thought is so powerful. Because every time we think thoughts, we believe thoughts, you send out energy and waves that affect other people. So when you're thinking that thought, Already I could feel that loving acceptance. And that gives people a form of a boost. People who you don't even realize you're blessing. But just being understanding when someone is frustrated and having a bad day and they happen to encounter you at a local rural farms and instead of reacting to their agitation, you just smile and say, hey, how are you? That is enough to deactivate, disarm that person, disarming with love. It's, Perhaps it's somewhere along the lines of what Gandhi had in mind when he talked about the nonviolent non resistance. Gandhi and other minds as well, Martin Luther King adopted that after reading, supposedly, after reading and learning about Gandhi, this nonviolent resistance about you know, needing to do things but being kind about things, being understanding and looking at people. Because that's the Christ consciousness, in a sense. Because it's being able to look at somebody else with no judgment. It doesn't matter where you've been, it doesn't matter who you are, what religious area you come from. I accept you because you are a child of God, and I honor you. You know, sometimes when we say namaste, you know, I honor the wholeness, the goodness, the love, the child of God that you are. That thought alone is a gift. It is worth more for anybody who's ever experienced a low moment in their life, where they just wanted a moment of peace or acceptance, and they meet people who have those ideas. It is like the best hug or best gift you can get. Truly it is. Thank you, Abby. Does anybody else have any comments or questions? Mike or son's Mike? Is it chocolate time? <laughs> yes, to celebrate the law. Chocolate only goes for those who asked a question. No, I'm just kidding. OK. So if no one has any other questions or comments, I, I was going to say. Oh, yes, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, no, I think that, that for me the best explanation of love is like when two people can be, when they can be themselves. They can be in the, the best expression the of love. The entire thing, not the half. And, you know what I mean? Because then if you can interact uh, and the other one can interact with you and this love and respect, then, you know what I mean? Like you can be yourself and the other one can be himself or herself. Right. And, and I think this naturalness, this um, uh, kind of uh, dynamics, I think that it's not like, like sometimes you see in movies, like, oh my God, you know, that all oh, that thing. And, and that 
that goes on the first crisis that goes yeah, and different, uh, different experiences thank you johnny different experiences in, in different books in the dry louise collection have told us stories just like that every lifetime depending upon what we need to accomplish our reincarnatory plan is set up according to our needs and the general needs of those that are around us so one request we have is take this little take home reflections with you, put it on your refrigerator, or maybe in your car or your purse. We have little reminders also at the bottom, little kind reminders, things to do. Yes, Daniel, I will read for those who are watching this video online or at other times. So some of these reminders come from uh, a book that's not yet in English, it's called Peace and Renovation. It's by the uh, Spirit Andrea Louise, by the medium Chico Xavier. So a couple of things are from the book, from one of the messages, and also just some kind reminders from the Spirit Society of Baltimore. So firstly, hold your God at Home meetings. If you don't know what that is, either you can email us, you can look on our website, or you come and approach one of us and we can explain more about that. And the following items that are highlighted or asterisked are from the book, Peace and Renovation. Complain as little as possible. If you cannot, Avoid it, avoid it at all. Let others live their own lives just as you live yours. Do not lose your faith in the effectiveness of work. Never believe that good can be achieved without difficulties. Cultivate perseverance. Be convinced that the only way to solve your problems is by facing them directly. Remember, disappointments, troubles, and trials are present in everyone's path. For this reason, in order to avoid being obsessed, the important aspect is not the suffering we endure, but rather our personal reaction toward it. And lastly, from the SSB, don't wait for a holiday to celebrate love and kindness towards others. So we will transition to our passes session of this evening. If you do not know what a passes session is, let us briefly explain it. Well, let us say how we shall be prepared for it and why we do certain things. So oftentimes we dim the lights. Why do we dim the lights? Well, for a couple of reasons. Um, we won't go too in depth of all the reasons why, but one of which it provokes us into a more meditative state, allows us to calm down, even for in a physical s sense, our senses are, some of them are deactivated by dimming the lights. It just is good for us and also allowing the spirits to do their work as well. Also, when we ask that you when we do a meditation or like a visualization, a guided visualization, if you're not comfortable doing a guided visualization or if you don't want to, you're not accustomed to prayers or you are accustomed to prayers, whatever your background may be, we just ask to think of a pretty picture. That's why we always put beautiful pictures because our mind creates images. Those images reverberate in sounds and colors. So we want this environment to facilitate the work of the higher spirits that come. So. We ask you for your cooperation. We know that you guys are always great about it. And we always ask when we call you up to the front, it's the same thing, or if you're waiting for the passes, because there are spirits that are here. Leo's gonna dim the lights. We're gonna do a short visualization. And if you're not sure what image to look at, you can think about this beautiful little tree here, beautiful summery day or spring day. Or perhaps you can imagine yourself being on a lovely, warm beach, just feeling at peace. Taking a deep breath in.